Now, today is International Youth Day. However, millions of young people in South Africa are challenged by both unemployment and poverty. The ailing economy and the rising cost of living continues to be a major concern. Some, some experts are warning the country is at risk of becoming a failed state. The latest crime stats paint a grim picture. The backdrop is a continuing theme of corruption, enrolling blackouts, water shortages, a shaky healthcare system, well, and myriad other state failures. Others say system. this is the cost so of so corruption and negligent leadership. Hello, John. How are you doing? Very well, thanks. And you, Gabriel? Oh, I'm doing very well, thanks. So I thought with this podcast, it might be more informative, instead of me giving you an introduction, for you to introduce yourself and the Institute of Race Relations, which you are the CEO of. Um, so would you like to start with a bit of a personal introduction, and then let's get into the Institute of Race Relations? Perfect. Uh, so my name is, is John Endres. I am the CEO of the Institute of Race Relations, as you've said. Uh, and in terms of my background, I've spent quite a lot of time both in the for-profit business sector and also in the non-profit sector. Mm. Uh, in terms of my academic background, um, I studied business administration in Germany, got a PhD uh, in commerce and economics on the topic of change management in cities, uh, and then later also added a master's degree in translation studies. Mm. So I'm uh, interested in many, many things, but I think what runs through all the things that I'm interested in is a constant interest in politics and in outcomes in society. Uh, and my particular interest there is in liberal politics as a school of thought. And so how did you get involved with the Institute of Race Relations? So that goes back quite a long way. Um, and it starts with my, the start of my working career mm. with a German political foundation called the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, which promotes liberal thought throughout the world, as well as democracy, human rights, civil rights, and free markets. Mm. And one of the partner organizations of the Nauman Foundation in South Africa was the Institute of Race Relations. Mm. Um, I was responsible for managing that relationship when I started work, um, first under supervision, later by myself. But I got to know the Institute even in those uh, long past times, it was quite a, quite a number of years ago. Mm. Uh, and even at that time, I realized that this was quite an exceptional organization, I think not just in the South African context, but even in the international context. Mm. Uh, and then I uh, maintained a relationship with the Institute in varying roles and capacities. At one point, um, I started a think tank called Good Governance Africa in collaboration with the Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, I also had the opportunity to work with Franz Cronje, uh, who I believe you've interviewed before. Yes. Um, and so, you know, over time, uh, I, I was within the uh, environment of the Institute and uh, joined it as a chief of staff in 2021, I think it was, uh, and then eventually progressed into the CEO role. And so let's talk a little bit about the Institute of Race Relations. So what is the IRR? So the Institute of Race Relations is a very old organization in South African terms. It was founded in 1929. So it is already heading towards its centenary, uh, which will be in 2029. Mm. And it was started back in the day by a group of concerned citizens who were particularly concerned about the way race relations were developing in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So you must keep in mind this was before the introduction of apartheid, which was only in 1948. But even before that, it was obvious that there were some problems beginning to emerge. And what these uh, citizens decided to do is that they effectively started off with something called joint councils which were like community meetings in various parts of the country where people would get together and sort of observe and comment on what was going on. Mm. That was then formalized as uh, an organization in 1929 dedicated to investigating the circumstances of life of South Africans with a particular interest in race relations and with the objective of achieving a South Africa in which South Africans can live together in a spirit of goodwill and ultimately also with improving prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Institute uh, spent a lot of time finding data, collating data, doing research, publishing papers and reports, mm -hmm. uh, describing exactly what was going on in the country. And one of the key figures in the history of the Institute of Race Relations is a man, John Cain Berman. He's a man whose name I've heard now mm -hmm. <laughs> plenty of times, but he's someone that I'm not too familiar with. And so, mm -hmm. Can you uh, just briefly explain kind of his, 
uh, importance to the Institute of Race Relations and what his legacy has been since he has, since he left the organization since he's passed on. Mm. Well, John Ken Bourbon passed away last year, um, mm. uh, suddenly and unexpectedly, mm. um, and left, I think, quite a large um, uh, vacuum because he was an exceptionally hard-working, principled and talented representative of liberalism in South Africa. Mm. He was the, the leader of the Institute from 1983 to 2014, so for 31 years, which is a really long time. Uh, he was the, uh, the CEO during the period of the transition, so you know, he took over during apartheid times, then guided the Institute through the transition into the mid-2010s. Mm. The legacy he left, I think, is firstly um, the thing that he was most proud of and thought the Institute should be most proud of, which is the fact of its survival. Because it is quite rare that organizations, especially if they're in a contested space like South African politics, to be able to make it for that long. Mm -hmm. And he played a great role in making sure that when he took over in 1983, he shepherded the organization through a period of great financial difficulty, uh, of uncertain focus in terms of what it should be working on towards 30 years of growing influence and prosperity, uh, principle-based, that he was able to hand over to Franz Cronje, who then eventually handed over to me. So a really remarkable South African and a very important personality in our history. And so <clears throat> you mentioned that you're coming up, the Institute is coming up on its centenary, and obviously the state of South Africa, it's now seen three different forms of governance. You have the, the colonial era, the apartheid era, mm -hmm. and the democratic era. And so how has the, the mission of um, the Institute of Race Relations changed through these different periods? And what was the kind of, what the key differences maybe between what it was trying to achieve under uh, an apartheid state, which was, you know, the opposite of the kind of liberal values, mm -hmm. and in now in the democratic era where you, if we formalized some liberal values into the constitution and the laws of this country, mm -hmm. but not, haven't necessarily done a good job in following through on that formalization. Mm -hmm. mm. So I think the key to the Institute's survival has been its adaptability. Mm. Um, and I think if it hadn't been adaptable and changed over time, it would not have survived. Mm. But there is a certain contradiction in that because it also had to remain, remain loyal and true to its values. Mm. And those values included, for example, um, a strict sense of non-racialism uh, and of non-discrimination on the basis of race, as well as a dedication to improving the prospects of South Africans in economic terms and in terms of coexistence and cooperation. Now, to achieve those objectives um, required different focus areas to be adopted by the Institute at different times. So very clearly during apartheid, the um, question of racial discrimination was obviously the main problem, the main focus area. Mm. But underlying that was the idea that apartheid was a severe restriction on the freedom of individuals. Mm. And I think that is the thread that you can draw through the entire history of the Institute and that draws back to this idea of liberalism. It has at its core the idea, uh, the word liber in, in Latin means free. Mm. And it is the freedom of the individual that was, um, was, was uh, not recognized during apartheid properly. Um, and that draws through into the present tense. So at the moment, if we look at South Africa, I think that we're still seeing quite a lot of race-based legislation. Uh, we have a project that we started uh, this year, no, last year we launched it, called uh, racelaw.co.za. Mm -hmm. where one of our colleagues, Martin von Staden, has looked for the number of laws that are based on race in South Africa and has identified, uh, I think, 134 laws that are currently in operation in South Africa that are based on race in a supposedly non-racial dispensation that is constitutionally mandated to be non-racial. But nonetheless, 116 laws have been passed since 1994 that use race as a basis for discriminating between people plus uh, some additional laws that are still kept from the previous dispensation. And so that is something that the Institute cares about. Um, yeah. We promote strict non-racialism. That means that individuals should be treated as individuals on their own merits and not as uh, exchangeable representatives of groups based on their, race, or on their skin color or race. Yeah, and I think that that project um, is incredibly important, in a, especially now given that it seems as though um, 
as the situation in South Africa has deteriorated um, along since about 2007 and the election of Jacob Zuma to the Palakwana conference, the, there's been a sense of doubling down on bringing race back into into mm. the fold. You know, we had we had the start of the race-based legislation from the beginning of the ANC with mm. Thabo Mbeki's CADA deployment happening in the '97 um, conference, and then we and we've seen that that thread ran through. But it seems as though to me, uh, and maybe you can correct my analysis here, but under Jacob Zuma, the race-based legislation and the kind of racial politics started to really heat up. And that see, that seemed to me to be a kind of smoke and mirrors tactic to mm. distract people away from the fact that during the, at the same time they were robbing the state blind of everything mm. they possibly could. Do you think that that's an accurate analysis? Yes. Um, so there's, there's a couple of points to, to note here. Uh, the first of which would be that we do some polling, for example, as the IRR, mm. that's commissioned polling. We've been doing it for 15 or 20 years. And one of the questions we ask people is, what are the top two priorities that need to be addressed in South Africa? What are the two biggest problems? Hmm. And reading the media, you would expect racism to be the number one problem. Hmm. But that's not how it turns out. The number one problem consistently for these 15 years has been unemployment. Number two has been uh, something related usually to service delivery or to crime and safety. Hmm. Racism does get mentioned, but it's really far down the list. It's at about 3% or 2% of respondents who say that this is the main issue that needs to be addressed. Mm. So that is a hopeful sign because it means that South Africans, we think, um, do care about bread and butter issues a lot more than they care about what could be uh, academic or theoretical issues like racism. Um, some other questions that we ask also indicate that racism in most people's daily lives is not a major concern. We ask people, have you experienced racism in the last five years? Most people say no. We ask people, do you think that the relationship between the races has improved or deteriorated since 1994? Most, most people say, well, obviously, things are better now than they used to be back then. <laughs> so given that, why are we seeing so much focus on race-based laws in South Africa? And I think uh, part of the explanation certainly is going to be that it is a distraction from underperformance by the government. Mm. So the areas, the things that people care about, like jobs and like uh, water and electricity, all of that isn't working, isn't being delivered on by the government. Mm. But at least they can say, we've got a huge other problem to deal with, which is racism, which uh, is insoluble effectively, but has to be fought. Uh, so you can't really measure us on whether we are successful or not. Uh, mm. But that's much more important than all that other stuff, which you know, affects your daily lives. Mm. Um, so I think it is, in a sense, a distraction. Yeah. I'd like to add one more point to that, which is that even though we promote and endorse strict non-racialism, we do understand and empathize for the moral argument for racial discrimination mm. in terms of rectifying the injustices of the past. And you might say those injustices were on a racial basis. So if you want to undo the harm that was done in the past, you need to apply the same measurement. Mm. It's not something we agree with, but you can understand it. It sort of makes sense at a certain level. Yeah. The thing is that the implicit justification is that using race-based legislation will in fact be effective mm. in addressing the discrepancies in South African societies and improving the lot of black South Africans and bringing them to the uh, level of white South Africans in terms of incomes, education, uh, jobs, you know, whatever you choose, overall the, 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 the outcomes are, sufficient, uh, are significantly more uh, positive for whites at the moment than they are for, for black South Africans. Mm. But that justification is fading fast because it turns out that it's not true. It hasn't worked out. Um, if we look at South Africa today, we think that about 15% of the population, if you're being generous, mm -hmm. has benefited from race-based advancement legislation like BE, like affirmative action. Mm. But what is left out of the equation is the 85% of the population that has not benefited and as a matter of fact is worse off as a result of race-based discrimination. Mm. These are poor South Africans who are not well connected to the political elites, to the, to the ANC, uh, who are dependent on the quality of state services in water, education, health, uh, security, electricity, all the things that the state is meant to supply mm. is not being supplied at a good quality. All of this is breaking down. And that is because 
um, race has been brought into this entire system as a criterion in appoint appointments, in procurement, uh, uh, and these are the, the outcomes that we get. We can, we can see that it's not working, and yeah. therefore we need to move away from the race-based legislation. For sure, and one of the projects or the campaigns that is currently underway um, is uh, stopping the BE at ESCOM. Mm -hmm. And so, why is why is that such an important campaign? And what role do you think BE has played in bringing this its service delivery into the awful <laughs> state that it is now? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I just wrote something on that um, because we saw the National Union of Mine Workers uh, saying that corruption is the reason why there's load shedding. Mm. And I don't think that's true. I think that is a fig leaf, smoke screen, if you will, because what it hides is that the load shedding and the electricity scarcity that we have in South Africa at the moment is a result of government policy rather than pure criminality. Mm. The government policies that play a role here are firstly cater deployment, mm -hmm. which means that you appoint people on the basis of party loyalty over competence. And that means that sometimes, maybe even often, you're going to be appointing people who are not right for the job. And I think you know that's indisputably the case across all the SOEs, across many government departments as well. The, the outcomes show that. Secondly, you've got the policy of racial discrimination in employment through BE and affirmative action. The point to make here, and that's a very important distinction, is that our observation is not that black people are not competent. And that the reason for failure in state-owned enterprises is because black people are running them and they can't do the job and therefore these organizations are failing. That's not the argument. Mm -hmm. The argument is if you want to run an organization, you need to be able to appoint the best people to any position no matter what their race is. Yeah. And we're moving away from, or we have moved away from that as a country. We've said, well, you know, it's quite important for the organization to be run properly. You know, it's one of the priorities but also transformation is a priority. And we are willing to compromise on performance, on output, on the quality of the results that we get in order to push and advance transformation. Mm. And that is a, a deal with the devil that is now being shown to be extremely detrimental to the country and especially to South Africa's poor people. Yeah. The same applies also in public procurement, you know, just as the, the third category where that applies, uh, where we have prefer preferential procurement legislation that brings race into uh, procurement processes and it allows non-value adding intermediaries in Andre de Rota's words to interpose themselves in value chains mm -hmm. and to increase the costs beyond what is sustainable for an operation. So companies like ESCOM <coughs> need to be able to <coughs> hire who they need to do the job. Mm. They need to be able to fire people who aren't performing. And at the moment, if you think of cater deployment, it looks like there's no degree of incompetence sufficient to get you fired. Mm. That's a big problem. And lastly, they need to be able to choose their suppliers based on price, mm. quality, and the ability to deliver and nothing else. And as soon as you start deviating from that and you say, we want to you know, build small black suppliers or prefer this group or give advantage to that group, you are opening up the scope for <coughs> corruption, for overpricing, for price inflation, that is leading to the outcomes that we've got now. Very sorry about this. So alongside um, the c campaign to stop the BE and the various race-based legislation at ESCOM, you have a, a campaign that looks at another very um, hot-button issue, which is to stop the expropriation bill. Mm -hmm. And so could you explain what the, what the expropriation bill is going to do and why it is so important that we must oppose it. Mm. Let me start with the second part of your question first. Mm. Um, and that is the, the, the entire um, principle underlying why we are fighting the expropriation bill is something called property rights. Mm. Property rights doesn't mean that property has rights, as some of our critics accuse us of, uh, of, of saying. That's not the case. What it means is the individual's right to own property and to dispose of that property as they see fit. Mm. What we are seeing in the form of the expropriation bill is the attempt of the state to interfere with that right and to weaken that right in a very substantial way. The back history is that um, the ANC uh, for, I think since 2007, 
has been floating this idea of expropriation without compensation, especially in the area of land. And since that time, the IRR has been warning about the risk and has been fighting back against that and has managed to delay the process to where we are now. If it hadn't been for the IRR and other civil society organizations, probably expropriation without compensation would already be in law today. Mm. And that would be very dramatic. The reason for that is that um, it's multiple. In terms of civil rights, if you cannot be sure of holding onto your property when the state comes to take it from you, then your civil rights are significantly weakened. Mm. And the argument here is that, let's say you own a house with a piece of property and you are a critic of the government. As long as you own your property, you are able to express your criticism and know that you retain that asset. Mm. But in an environment where expropriation without compensation becomes possible, the government can come to you and say, look, Ariel, you're actually being you know, a little bit too critical here. And we do have this expropriation law on our books. Yeah. Wouldn't you want to reconsider some of the statements that you've made recently? Mm. And you might say, well, you know, this is my livelihood. This is the place I stay. Maybe it's a place I, I generate income from. I can't afford to lose that. So I'd better tone down my language. And that's where your freedom of speech immediately goes out the window. The same applies to freedom of association. If you don't have property that you can feel safe on because it's yours, you are exposed to your freedom of association being taken away. Your ability to operate a business is dependent on the ability to, to own property. Mm -hmm. And those are all sort of civil rights kind, uh, kinds of ideas. But in very practical terms also, a modern economy depends on secure property rights. So if you go to a bank and you say, you know, I want to borrow a million rand, the bank will say, sure, <laughs> will you be able to pay it back? You say, I promise I'm going to pay it back. Yeah. And say, well, you know, your promise is very nice, but we would actually like you to put something on the table that's worth a million rand. So if you stop paying us, we can take that thing. Mm. That's your collateral. Now, if you are in a dispensation where expropriation without compensation is possible, mm. you go to the bank. The bank says, what's your collateral? You say, I've got this property. I'm willing to mortgage that uh, so you can lend me the money. The bank is going to say, well, you say that you own this property. You've got the title deed. But we know that the government has the power to take that away from you without paying you. Mm. So how much is that really worth? Yeah. Not very much. And so that is going to break the credit cycle in South Africa if it passes. In the best case, it's going to raise interest rates because banks will impose a risk premium on their loans. They'll say, will you take the chance because, you know, not that many properties are being expropriated. Maybe this one is safe. But just for safety, we're going to, you know, double your, your, your interest rate. It's going to make the entire economy less productive, less competitive on a global uh, stage. It's going to cause a, a recession, unemployment and poverty. Mm. That's going to be the, the impact of the expropriation bill if it gets passed. It's, Get it's a very rosy outlook. Um, it's serious. It's very serious. Yeah, and it's yes. an, and I and I agree. I think that um, that as uh, as we kind of navigate the tricky waters that have been created by thirty years, well, the last fifteen years of the ANC's mismanagement of the country, the temptation on the behalf of that government, and it's something that we talked about when we first met, mm -hmm. is that. Um, it is to open the spending taps and to start to give people and vote and the voter base what they want without any thought for the long term outlook because they have to they their primary goal is to survive the short term the next the next year and a half before the election mm -hmm. and after that well we'll see what that comes after that um, and exactly. But I do, I do want to move us away from talking about some of the dire and desperate uh, parts of uh, parts of the South African state for the moment, because mm -hmm. we will go back when we look at uh, at the outlook for the election. But I want to talk to uh, talk about one of the research outputs, which I thought was incredibly fascinating, which is that you have uh, on the IRR website an output called Free Facts, mm -hmm. um, which focuses in and provides a very good in-depth analysis on various aspects, including the kind of the prospect of cities and the importance of cities and the economy. But the one I want to focus on is international trade. Mm -hmm. um, and you point out in that that um, we have a huge trade deficit with the EU. And so what is the driving factor behind our trade deficit with the EU? 
um, how do we and how would you think we start to reduce that deficit or is it not necessary for us to reduce the deficit? Um, so I think generally in, in commentary, um, deficits are often presented as a bad thing, mm. but that's not necessarily true because uh, even though you're sending your money overseas in order to purchase overseas goods, for example, you are getting those goods in exchange, mm. right? So you're actually benefiting from it. And the fact that those exchanges are taking place indicates that the value that you're deriving from your imports actually exceeds the value of the money that you're sending out of the country. Mm. So I think a deficit per se is actually fine. You know, it's, uh, it depends on what sort of products you produce in your country. Um, uh, you know, that's that's market forces at work. You know, you prefer the imports of the of the of the, of the money that you're sending overseas. Mm. Um, at the same time, South Africa does. Uh, is a strong exporting nation because of its commodities, especially, mm. and that certainly gives up gives it uh, a good, I think, counter position to its imports. Is that it is able to sell, for example, a lot of coal to Europe, as we've seen with the Ukraine Russia war at the moment, mm. um, but as well as as uh, iron, for example, uh, precious metals, and also many metals that are involved in the renewable energy transition. Mm. So, like the platinum group metals, for example, iridium specifically. Uh, and other uh, ferrous metals. Mm. And um, what uh, in one of the the, the conclusions from um, that Freefax uh, paper was that one of the things, one of the focus areas, should be on driving up into African trade. Mm -hmm. So, what do you see as the benefit of of driving up into into African trade? Um, so, that's a tricky one because. I think there's a lot of, there was about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, a lot of boosterism about South Africa, uh, about Africa as a continent. Mm. It was uh, presented as Africa rising, uh, the, the growing markets, the huge opportunity for, for the world, etc., etc. I think that didn't quite pan out over the last few years. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's a, a very big opportunity in boosting intra-African trade. Mm. Um, at the moment, there are very substantial barriers to such trade which are particularly of the non-trade, uh, non-tariff barrier nature. So that means things like paperwork, like delays at border crossing, mm. uh, like uh, corruption and uh, sort of lawlessness in those interactions. And by bringing down those costs of trading across the borders, you'd enable African countries to specialize in supplying certain goods and services and receiving them from other nations within Africa as well. So at the moment, most of Africa's trade is still with the rest of the world. Uh, the, the very uh, significant minority of its trade is within the continent itself. Um, but that would be an obvious growth market and opportunity for African countries to exploit. Yeah, and it also t uh, it allows us the opportunity to kind of shorten some of the supply chains that we're reliant on for our global trade, yes. as well as bring in trading partners. But one of the, the things I worry about in is that there is kind of a moral hazard in trading uh, and engaging with large-scale trades with autocratic countries, dictatorships, mm -hmm. and the like. So, you know, having Zimbabwe as a massive, as one of our bigger African trading partners doesn't necessarily sit well, and I don't think mm -hmm. would necessarily gel with the kind of uh, liberal ideas of the Institute of Race Relations. So do you, but one of the thing, one of the arguments that I hear passed around a lot is that one of the best ways to try and democratize a country is to make it richer. Mm -hmm. um, China seems to have <laughs> pointed, that, pointed out that that's not necessarily the case, yeah. but it's still, it still has some sort of kind of an implicit, this makes some sort of sense. So do you think that that's a possibility in our trade with African countries, or would we have to pursue a much more aggressive foreign policy to force them into democratization? That, that, yeah, there's another tricky question because you know if you were morally pure, yeah. you should only trade with countries that are you know perfect democracies ideally and mm. exclude everybody else from your from your trading um, partner block. And I think that is unrealistic. Mm. You know, it is, uh, there's uh, you, you be, it would be so restrictive that the uh, disadvantages would far outweigh the benefits that you might derive from holding that position. Mm. I also think at the same time that um, trade per se is a uh, probably a peace and stability generating activity between nations as well as the democratization and liberalization aspect that you mentioned. Mm. 
The proviso here is that the trade should be as much as possible conducted between private entities and as little as possible contract, uh, uh, controlled by the state in question. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if, if, if an uh, autocratic state, dictatorial state, determines the customs rules, the import regulations, the licensing, uh, the duties, the fees, the taxes, and gets a very large cut out of the trade, then you are, in fact, entrenching the authoritarian system. Mm -hmm. And that is another argument for intra-African trade liberalization to say that you actually want to, the government to have a much reduced role within those commercial interactions. Mm. You want companies yeah. and individuals to trade with each other, benefit from that, and also see the value in having relationships with other countries and people in other countries and companies in other countries. Mm. That's actually mm. where the value lies. And that is something you should want to promote. For sure. Um, and I think that the, um, the importance of that is that we do, that Africa is likely at some point, given that it is lagged behind the rest of the world in mm -hmm. terms of development, to hopefully catch up and start to explode and become these emerging markets. And so mm -hmm. you would want South Africa to, as one of the biggest African economies, to be involved in that and to reap the benefits all around from that inter-African trade, rather than having the, um, the growth of these massive emerging markets um, benefit places like Europe or mm -hmm. North America. Exactly. So Africa is, is well positioned to benefit from demographic developments and also from the saturation of markets. So mm -hmm. um, around the world, birth rates are declining um, in some countries below replacement levels. So we'll have shrinking populations in many countries, including China. And Africa is the only continent at the moment that has still a high birth rate and a growing population. So it's going to be a very attractive market for the rest of the world. And South African companies that are able to uh, facilitate entry into the African market and partner with, with foreign companies, for example, will be very well positioned uh, to make use of that opportunity. The proviso here is that you do need a good governance framework for the opportunities to be realized. Yeah. And that is unfortunately where many African countries fall short. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this opportunity might be squandered for reason of institutional weakness uh, corruption, weak education systems, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. yeah, um, and that would be a terrible pity because the opportunity is there. Yeah, it would indeed be a terrible pity. But I think maybe let's turn our attention um, away from looking at the rest of Africa and go back into South Africa. And the Institute of Race Relations, as you mentioned, does an incredible amount of research into South Africa, looking at mm. various political trends, cultural trends, um, and. I, um, I want maybe to ask a couple of questions about um, some of the research you've done, the, the, but more of the long-term outlook that you've mm -hmm. been able to glean from uh, the research of the Institute of Race Relations. So the first question I have regarding this is, what are some of the most important trends um, that have been ongoing in South Africa? Okay, so, so most recently... Um, we are at the moment living through a period in South African history that I think is going to be seen in retrospect as having been a really decisive one in the country's history. Mm. And from where we are sitting now, the way we're experiencing it, it is extremely unsettling. Mm. There's a high degree of volatility and a high degree of uncertainty about where things are going. Mm. And I think this is inherent in the nature of transitions like the one we're experiencing at the moment. Looking ahead, the concern is that there are many ways for things to go wrong. Mm. There are some ways for things to go right. But South Africa, you know, th this is what the Institute cares about, is that we choose some of the ways of things going right. Mm. And, you know, that's essential for the Institute's mission of promoting goodwill between South Africans as well as the advancement and, and the improvement of the prospects in the lives of South Africans. Mm. Looking at the big trends at the moment, one big trend for me is the... Uh, retreat of the state in terms of its authority, its credibility, and its competence. Mm. We're seeing that across the board. Um, most clearly, I think, uh, expressed in the July 2021 riots, mm. where we saw the state's core function, which is the mon monopoly on violence and the ability to enforce law and order, absent for a period mm. of a week, which was really disturbing to see yeah. for many South Africans, including myself. 
But we're seeing that in many other areas. We're seeing it in, in service provision, ranging from water to electricity, to education, to health across the board. Mm -hmm. The question now becomes, what, what does that trigger? And the worrying outlook would be that it triggers a form of uh, lawlessness and anarchy. And that is a possibility. But I think that usually a state of lawlessness does not prevail for long. Mm. Some forms of structures emerge out of society to deal with the uncertainty that is created by this environment. And those structures might be uh, uh, state government led type structures. Mm -hmm or they can be private structures. And what we're seeing at the moment in South Africa is the state structures increasingly being supplanted by private structures. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we saw the, uh, the uh, new electricity minister saying that the state, all three spheres of the state, national, provincial, municipal, were going to go off the grid. And what a remarkable thing that is. You know, imagine, you've got a state that has taken responsibility for the electricity system, has failed so badly, at running it, that they themselves now say, we can't rely on this thing anymore. And we're going to take ourselves off the grid. This is an absolutely amazing thing that's happening. Yeah. We've seen the chairman of the ESCOM board calling on consumers who are able and in a position to do so, to please install solar electricity and to stop using the main product, the only product supplied by ESCOM, because they realize they cannot supply it. Um, and that is... I think that is a trend that is probably unstoppable at the moment. The good way in which it can unfold is that we see the development of many localized solutions mm. in many variations with the good solutions prevailing, the bad solutions being sorted out or sort of uh, being abandoned. And over time, a new way uh, being brought about of addressing the needs of a society from private schooling to private security private electricity, private water maybe, mm. across the board. This is already happening right now. The worry here is that um, the scale of this replacement will be too small mm. to satisfy the needs of most of society, or that those solutions are going to be ring-fenced, in a sense, to certain communities to the exclusion of the broader society, which is not going to be a sustainable solution. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, we're, we're, we're in, in this process of volatility and experimentation, exploration that puts us in a position to find those solutions, which can make South Africa one of the most interesting countries in the world in the decade ahead, the next 15 years ahead. Yeah. And mm. what's interesting is that um, as the as the state seems to be to be breaking down mm. the uh, the kind of ideological bearing of the ANC, which has been to govern as centrally as possible, mm -hmm. has been shown for what it really is, which is an outdated and uh, frankly ridiculous form of gov style of governance, it's particularly mm -hmm. in a country like South Africa. We wrote into the constitution that we should pursue some sort of federal system and the ANC, obviously that great, goes completely against the grain of any sort of ANC thinking, and so they didn't pursue it whatsoever. Um, and one wonders, um, as, a, as a counterfactual, what the country would have been like had they had they pursued federalism and had we been able to develop a federal state kind of in the ilk of uh, the United States. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> now that the, the, the central governance of the ANC is broken down and um, they are de defaulting to the privatization arguments, uh, they're looking at at how do we get these things off our hands because we don't know how to run them mm. and frankly running them is costing us uh, is bleeding us votes and costing us is going to eventually cost us an election and what we're likely to see in the next election is that the ANC gets dropped below its the 50% uh, mark for the first time uh, in this country's democratic history and the question then becomes is how low are they going to fall mm -hmm. and already you know um, Polls, the polls from last year had them sitting anywhere between 46 and 48 percent. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with, we we have to take into account the margins of error that are baked in there, mm -hmm. but that means that they were going to go below majority. And now it looks as though you know the DA put out a tra had a tracking poll which had the ANC at less than 40 percent, mm -hmm. and that's not a long time for them to have bled another 
eight to ten percent of the vote. Mm -hmm. And the question then becomes how how much more will they bleed? And so do you think that the ANC is likely to be able to recover from some of these trends that we're seeing? And do you think that and where do you think they're going how far do you think they're going to fall in the next election? Mm. I mean that's the question everybody wants to know the answer to. Mm. Um, and I don't think there's a an answer to that. Um, but two comments would be firstly uh, that I, I would tend to think that ANC support is under polling. Because rural areas are not as well covered as urban areas. Mm -hmm. The ANC has been weakening in urban areas much faster than in rural areas. Its support levels are still high in rural areas. And most of the polling that is being done relies on cell phones. So you need coverage, you need electricity, you need you know, data on your cell phone or airtime at least. Mm -hmm. And you're more likely to have all of those things if you're in a town than if you're in, in the rural area somewhere. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, rural support for the ANC is probably going to pull up those results compared to what the polling is saying at the moment. Mm. That having been said, I think the direction of travel is clear. Uh, I think if, if we look at the, the polls of last year, we can see a declining trend in the polling results. So all things being equal, the direction of travel is downwards. Um, and uh, as you said, you know, some of the lowest polls have got the ANC at a 37%. I think if you factor in that, that rural aspect, they probably are above 40 mm. But I think we are going to see increasing evidence during the course of this year as more polling gets done of the ANC actually with greater certainty being below 50%, mm. uh, with somewhat greater certainty below 45. And at this stage, I still think it's unlikely that they're going to go below 40. Mm. Um, I think, you know, if, you, if the DA places hopes in that, they might be disappointed. Um, it might look quite encouraging from their perspective. Um, but I think that is probably, it's not going to go that far. Yeah. Um, in the last national elections, the ANC got 57%, I think. I think a 10 percentage point drop would be a very large drop, which yeah. would put them at 47. I think a 20 percentage point drop would be very unexpected. Yeah. It's not impossible, but you know, yeah, it's it could have a miraculous kind of result to have. Yeah, that would be really big. Um, but then, you know, looking at you know what 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 keeps up the ANC support levels, you know, it's like your your reputation, the strength of your brand, your ability to deliver. Uh, your operational efficiency, your financial strength, all of those things are weak at the moment. Mm. And none of that is looking like it's going to boost their numbers. Um, and that, that lends credence to the idea that they are, in fact, dropping um, and probably are going to come in at 45, about 45, I think. And one, but one of the scary things about um, the question of how, fall the, uh, how far the ANC is going to fall mm -hmm. uh, is that... Um, Dependent on what they what they get and what the EFF gets is that um, <clears throat> the path of least resistance to maintaining power might be to just team up with the EFF because it will put them slightly above majority, which means that they can form a government, which means that they mm -hmm. can have the presidency. Problem with that being that that seems um, I, I I cannot see how that does not start. Um, to accelerate some of the downward trends that we've uh, we've had in the country, so mm -hmm. you know, I don't I don't think that the EFF has managed to put a coherent policy out on anything except maybe the removal of most white people from the country, um, mm -hmm. and so my question then becomes is like, what should we be hoping for here in terms of the the loss of the ANC? Obviously. You, there's there's a certain amount of glee that people are taking that finally the ANC is going to get the the loss that it deserves and I think that that's a that shouldn't be the perspective that people have because you know that to some degree we owe the ANC an incredible amount that they managed to ride the the tumultuous times in the in the 90s mm -hmm. um, and develop the country in many different ways you know and it was under an ANC government that we had growth above 5% over a four-year period, um, and that was the first time since the 60s. Mm. And so we can't, we shouldn't be, you know, celebrating and, 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 and celebrating their downfall to such an extent, but one would be kind of happy to see that, you know, after years and years of mismanagement and failure, that they are finally getting punished electorally. Mm. But that does leave the question is, you know, how how far do we want them to fall and what and what are some of the different scenarios that happen with the ANC finally becoming a minority party? Mm. So 
I mean, I think you started out your question with asking about some of the, the hopeful scenarios or what can we you know, mm -hmm. um, expect to see that would be positive. And I put out as the first scenario, um, ANC reform. Mm. So let's say you know, they, they catch a wake up call. They realize that you can't keep going on with the corruption, the incompetence, the ideological dogmatism that has guided policy for so long. And there has to be radical change. Uh, we see a reorientation towards market-friendly policies, towards non-race-based policies. Um, we see improving outcomes as a result of that. Unfortunately, I think that scenario is really unlikely. Um, mm. you know, so <laughs> from what we're seeing from the party, uh, in terms of uh, personnel choices, in terms of uh, policy statements, in terms of policy conferences, it looks like we're not going to see any change of that nature. Mm. So that scenario, I think, is pretty much off the table. The second scenario would be the ANC and the DAA working together in some capacity, um, be it uh, in a coalition or in some sort of working arrangement with a minority government and a confidence and supply arrangement where um, the DAA is able to bring to bear its superior governance uh, capacity in cooperation with the uh, emotional attachment to the ANC, the uh, the, the buy-in that the ANC is able to get from South Africans mm. and that that leads to a ho hopeful outcome. Now there also I think that the chances aren't that great and the reason for that is that um, it would require the DA to be extremely focused, extremely certain of its own identity mm. and being able to preserve that identity uh, through, say, a five-year period of office together with the ANC mm. without being dragged down by the kind of dysfunctionality that we've come to associate with the ANC. And I think that the DA at the moment, I'm not sure that it's got the strength to do that. And mm. My concern would be that instead the DA is going to become uh, infected with the dysfunctionality of the ANC and itself decline in the run-up to 2029 with little to show in terms of improvements in governance the economy, mm. employment, all the things that need to improve. So this scenario, again, I think is, uh, under current circumstances, um, un unfortunately unlikely to deliver. Third scenario would be a coalition under exclusion of the ANC. Uh, this is the scenario where the ANC drops to 37, 35, mm. where even with the EFF, it can't get a majority. Mm. And the, the DA, together with other opposition parties, is able to sweep up all the other opposition parties, excluding the ANC and the FF, and say, guys, we need to get, a, get together at the table uh, and we need to find a, form a government and introduce policy reforms that are going to fix the country. Mm. Again, I think that's not likely to, to work. Um, firstly, because uh, at the moment, I'm not really seeing the numbers work out. It would require the ANC to fall further than I think it will at the moment. Mm. Plus, it is going to need many of the parties that are um, probably not reliable allies or natural allies of an ANC co led, of a DA-led coalition to buy into that and to maintain loyalty to that coalition. Mm. Plus, you've got this very, very big problem, which is the state of the state machinery. The machine is broken at the moment. The entire 1.2, 1.3 million civil servants uh, supplying education service, health service, electricity, electricity if you include the SOEs, is not working properly and for a non-ANC coalition to address that civil service reform is going to be a huge issue because many of those people are deployees or they are loyal to the movement and they will not be very happy improving their service levels under a government led by somebody else. I don't think it's impossible but it will be very very difficult. So in, in two of those scenarios where, with, where the DA is involved I'm looking at that party specifically and saying if you want to make this work you really need to pull your socks up. Yeah. You need to figure out your policies. You need to work on your identity. You need to attract private sector skills, probably. You need to uh, build relationships with small opposition parties that are reliable and strong, which is a big challenge. But if you don't manage to do all of those things, then you're not going to make this work. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it is, it is crunch time. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly. And um, the possibility you didn't get to addressing was the ANC and the EFF. So what do you yes. think the outlook is with something like that? So I was trying to look at hopeful outlooks. <laughs> um, and there, there's, there's a hopeful outlook in that, um, which is, it, it is a bit uh, bleak, I think. Um, 
but the hopeful outlook in an ANC FF coalition uh, is a subject to scenario. It mm. is subject to South Africa remaining an open, free, and democratic society into 2029. Mm. So I think if you've got an ANC FF administration, um, outcomes are not going to improve. They will probably worsen. Mm. The natural effect of that in an open, free, and democratic society is a decline in support for the parties responsible for that. And you could see by 2029 the ANC and the EFF both so thoroughly discredited that by necessity an opposition coalition needs to take over in 2029. Mm -hmm. But that really only works if you've still got the democracy by 2029, yeah. which I think is possible. Um, you know, it's not, not impossible, but it is, it is a risky scenario. You know, it's not one that you would enter into happily or voluntarily, necessarily. Yeah. Uh, but maybe if it's the one you're presented with, that's how you can make it work. You say, okay, give these guys a turn, give them a go, let them do, the, do their best or do their worst, mm. and let the voters decide in 2029 whether to reward them or to punish them. Mm. And likely they would be punished, and that opens up that opportunity for something better to come after 2029. <laughs> <laughs> so, not the, not the font of hope that I thought you would be <laughs> around these topics, but... I think it is important that we do have a real, realistic outlook on uh, what is what is possible going into 2029. And you know, as you point out, there aren't that many scenarios that could happen. Mm. Um, you know, obviously, always a meteor could strike the the planet Earth, and things could be completely different. Yes. Um, but uh, the the fact is probably that we're going to have to live with the ANC for another election cycle. And the mm. question then is. What, what ANC are we living with? So I'd like to give you two, two hopeful comments on this. Mm. And, and the first is um, that uh, what we're experiencing at the moment is an expression of a quite significantly uh, unusual constellation, which is a very young democracy, having come out of a liberation uh, experience, and really demonstrating the key values of how democracies are meant to work. And that is the very significant freedom of expression that we've got. You know, we're able to be as critical as we are mm. in public without having to be concerned for our safety. It's not the case across most of Africa. Mm. This is a very, very big achievement. We're also seeing genuine political contestation uh, through elections between parties that uh, represent different constituencies. We're seeing the push and pull of negotiation, of manifestos, of demonstration of, of capability, of capacity, of ideas, of ideologies, the contestation of ideologies. That is part of democracy. And many societies don't have that luxury. Mm. This is actually how the mechanism is meant to work. Yeah. You, know, you do actually want to see uh, the contesting ideas in a society and the contesting interests to be expressed through the democratic process. And we are doing that in South Africa. This is a huge thing. Mm. The second hopeful thing is that we're also seeing the uh, retreat, involuntary as it might be, of the state and the opening up of space for a diversity of solutions and approaches to solving the problems of the country and addressing the needs of the society. Mm. Uh, and that is what South Africa is also doing. We can see it in action every single day in South Africa. And those two things together are really, really important. Um, I think that's a, a place that many countries never get to or haven't gotten to yet. And South Africa, only 30 years after its democratic transition, is now in that space. And that is you know, one, one of the way in which things can go right. Mm -hmm. So if you say it, democracy is functioning the way it is meant to function. It's messy, it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's uh, unpleasant, it's anxiety inducing. But actually, this is what you want. What you don't want is like a strongman, uh, an authoritarian leader to impose his will on the process mm. and determine the outcomes. That is very, very bad, but that's what usually happens. In South Africa, that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing contestation. This is, a, this is a good thing. This is a good outcome that we've got at the moment. But we need to maintain that. Yeah. So the risk is if, if we lose those two things between now and 2029, then we've really got a problem. As long as we hold on to those two things, we're actually in a good position. And... This ties very neatly back in with the points that you were raising right at the beginning when talking about the Institute of Race Relations and its mm -hmm. necessity. 
that we only maintain the positive and hopeful aspects as long as we maintain the strong civil so strong civil society organizations mm -hmm. that are able to push for push against the government express themselves and fight for the necessary freedoms and liberties of the of the people mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> i think that this is actually a perfect place for us to to end the conversation but i would like to thank you for taking the time to speak to me today it's been fascinating to hear about the history of the IR and to hear what you're working on. And although it, is, it wasn't necessarily the most hopeful <laughs> discussion, it does leave me with you know, at least a sense that there is opportunity for this country to take the place that I think it should in the world as a mm. miracle on the tip of Africa that was somehow able to get the democratic project right. Mm. I'd like to, to, to add a closing comment, if I may, Gabriel. Yeah, of course. Which is um, that, yes, the IRR is a really special asset in South Africa's democratic society. I think it, is, it has played a very important role already historically. And I think it will continue to play a very important role. And it is able to do so because it is a collection of exceptional individuals, both on staff and associated with the Institute, that are principled, that desire the positive outcomes for South Africa, and that work incredibly hard in order to achieve these outcomes. Mm. And that is something not to be neglected. You know, many of the countries that turned authoritarian didn't have something like this, an organization that was brave, that mm. was adaptable, that stood up for the right things, and that was able to shift the trajectory of an entire country towards better outcomes, mm -hmm. which the Institute did in the run-up to 1990, 1994, has continued to do and will continue to do in order to try to get us to that point where South Africans live in a non-racial country with mm -hmm. improving prospects and, and peace as well, which was also part of the original objectives. Well, I think there's the hopeful note for us to end on. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Gabriel.